Welcome to Kingdom Life Radio. This is Kenny Hebert, and today we will uh, be in part three on the series we started uh, titled, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. We started this series a couple of weeks ago in Luke 11, where the disciples had watched Jesus praying, and as soon as he was done praying, they requested Jesus to teach them how to pray. And what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at different aspects of the Lord's Prayer, uh, especially one that's in, in Matthew 6 is the longer version. Matthew Luke 11, verse 2 through 4 is a shorter version of it. But focusing on Matthew 6, where Jesus teaches the whole crowd at the Sermon on the Mount how to pray. And it's, and it's not just to learn about prayer, but we're been, we've been looking at seeing the, the undergirding beliefs and values uh, that shape Jesus' life. Remember, this is, this, Jesus is holistic in regards to his life and his prayer and his actions, his words and his works. All together was, was, was in harmony with each other. So when he prayed and how he prayed and was shaped by what he believed and what he valued in regards to the kingdom of God, his Father in heaven, who he was. And last week we focused on uh, the, the phrase, Our Father in Heaven. And, and what we saw was that in Jesus' life, his words and works that he did flowed as an integrated whole from this, this genuine, personal, personal, dynamic relationship he had with the Father in Heaven. And this week, we will be picking up at the phrase, Hallowed be your name. And with a focus of, of talking about worship with regard to Jesus calling them as a part of the prayer is, to, is worship. Let's read Matthew 6, verse 9 through 13. It's the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it says, uh, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our, uh, have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we talk, Jesus starts this prayer with our Father, with his emphasis on having this personal connection and personal relationship with God, who is, who is a personal caring God, but then adds, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Um, these words, in heaven and hallowed, remind us of something about God, that he's not just this doting Father, but that he's transcendent. He's wholly other than we are. That he's sovereign, he's sacred. Uh, see, there should be this this tension. He's, even as we talked about last week, this this tension of having this relationship with God the Father, where we feel free, we feel comfortable and, and confident, almost familiar with the Father. Uh, even as I talked about how my how my grandson talked about you know waiting for his daddy to come home to put him to bed, there was this confidence and and and, and knowledge that he had. It's an intimate understanding that his his, his dad cared for him. So we're supposed to have that, and with that tension with God the Father, there's at the same time, there's this deep uh, reverence and fear and humility we're, we're called to walk in. So we have both these sides of it, this comfortable, confident, um, free uh, approach and uh, relationship with the Father, with Abba, and at the same time, a deep reverence and fear and humility for who He is, is the sovereign over all creation. And Jesus instructs them to ask that God's name be hallowed. So he says, hallowed be your name. He's asking, say, saying, he's ask, you're asking God's name to be hallowed. In their culture, uh, a person's name was really a reflection, uh, a representation of who they were. Their name represented their character, and, and in God's case, his attributes. Now, Jesus is not telling them to ask that God would become holy, you know, because God's already holy. So he's not, they're not, he's not saying, you ask God to become holy. He's holy already. But what he's asking, he's saying is asking that the Father may be treated as holy and that his name, which represents all that he is, should be seen and understood as sacred or holy or set apart in the lives of his people. And that his name should not be despised by the thoughts or words or conduct of those who have been created in his image. Let's look at Psalm 19, verse 1 through 2. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. When it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, He's, he's saying the, the, the heavens 
uh, uh, the heavens account, they recount, they continue to rehearse the glory, the majesty, the splendor, and the wealth of who God is. See, they continually make known God is hallowed, God is splendor, God, God's wealth and majesty. And they, the skies uh, above, they proclaim his handiwork. And then in verse 2, it says, day to day they pour out speech, and night to night they reveal knowledge, just like the heavens here. Uh, and we're, we're calling hallowed be your name. Day by day, our lives pour out speech, and they reveal knowledge and value of our Father. See, how we live, everything we do or say, are, are a part of what either hallows the Father's name or profanes his name. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, he says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, this, this, this uh, lesson about this, these programs about the Lord teaches to pray, it's not about teaching, giving you certain things to pray, how to say those things. It's really, I'm, I'm focusing on some of the things that we're, we see in other teaching, other aspects of Jesus' life in the Gospels, that expressed some things Jesus uh, believed about the Father and wanted us to understand that really affect how we pray, our, our sacred conversation in our lives as we live it out within this, this, uh, this, uh, this world. Now we're going to go to John uh, 4:19 uh, to a story of when Jesus met a Samaritan woman at a well. Um, you may be familiar with it, but it's, not, it's, a, it's a great story of Jesus uh, uh, Extending the kingdom to the Samaritans. Now, first, I want to give you some background to the story. You know, the Jews and the Samaritans during Jesus' day, they didn't get along. The Jews did not like the Samaritans. They looked down on them. They didn't want the Samaritans in their temple in Jerusalem, or they didn't want them to be a part of their worship. So the Samaritans, what they did, they created their own temple in Samaria with its worship and sacrifices. And the Jews would avoid going through Samaria. But Jesus intentionally goes into Samaria and he meets and starts to talk to a Samaritan woman and asks her for a drink at the well. And I have to understand that the Jews, uh, Jewish people would not associate or talk with Samaritans, nor would a Jewish man talk to a Samaritan woman, especially alone. They definitely would not drink from the same cup as they would. Some would have thought that Jesus was profaning the name of God, but he was about to reveal the glory of God and to hallow his name before this people. See, in the middle of their conversation, Jesus, by insight from the Holy Spirit, tells the Samaritan woman about a husband she said she did not have. You're right, you don't have a husband. You have five, you have had five, and the one you live with now is not a husband, he tells her. There was no way for Jesus to know that unless God the Father told him. And she, the Samaritan woman, knows it. And now we will pick up on the conversation with her response to Jesus. Now let's go to John 4, chapter 4, verse 19 through 24. The woman says to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem that it's the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Her response tells you that that Jesus said something that got her attention. Like, how did he know this? She recognizes Jesus is a prophet and has this connection to God. This gets her attention, her thinking about God. Maybe this this even brings some conviction to her life. She says, our fathers worship on this mountain, but you, you, you Jews, Say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You catch what she's saying? You say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You say you have have worship right, that you have the right place to worship. You have the right way to worship, and we Samaritans don't. And besides that, you Jews don't like us and don't even want us near you, your temple or your worship. 
I can hear between the lines at her asking, when she's really asking, does God even like me? Does he want me near? I know you guys don't, but does he? You thought this kind of thing of being critical of another's worship and how it profanes God's name is something new? See, there's nothing new under the sun. This critical spirit of measuring ourselves against others, our way is the right way and your way is the wrong way, and God doesn't like you because of it, that was active in Jesus' day just as it is right now in ours. And we are all prone to it. And it does nothing to hallow God's name. So let's look at how Jesus responds to her. Remember, she is concerned about God, about being right with God and worshiping the right way, right? Verse 21 through 23, Jesus says, The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The hour is coming, in fact, it's here right now. He's saying, you know, it's coming, but it's right now. Right now, as he's talking to her. And it's here right now for us. You've been seeking a method, a religious practice that you can work, that is the right way to get you to God. But worship is not about being in, his te- in this temple or that temple or doing that practice or that sacrifice. It's not about a building or a church or a certain kind of song or liturgy. No, the Father is not seeking a building or a certain practice. It says, Jesus said he's seeking people. People who will worship him. He's seeking you. He sent me here to find you and reveal him to you. See, Jesus came to Samaria to find that woman. And he's saying, the Father is seeking people just like you who want to worship and want to understand that. And he's seeking you, and he, he sent me here for, you, for here to find you and to reveal him to you. See, Jesus chose a hallowed life. He chose to hallow God's name in his words and his works, reflected his Father and his Father's heart for her. He was extending the invitation of the Father to her. Return to me. To you who are wandering or or feeling lost and wondering if God likes you and you're looking you're, you're looking for a way to find your way to God, it's not about the right place or the right kind of practice. It's about you. And the Father is seeking you and he sent Jesus so you and I can have a personal relationship with him and his people. See, the Father, Jesus said, the Father is seeking people, true worshipers, not a certain kind of worship activity that's that's restricted to some specific place or some specific time frame, but worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Worshipers Worshipers who are alive through the new birth of the Spirit, who are full of and enabled and empowered by the Spirit and the love of the Father. Worshippers who live in the truth, and they live by the truth of who God is, who live a real, genuine life with no religious mask or pretending and living that way before God and before men. See, so worshipers who hallow his name, who will live a life of sacred conversation with the Father in the sanctuary of this world, so that others would see the Father for who He really is and hear the Father calling to them, Return to me. Let's go to Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, and read there uh, where Paul's writing uh, to the church. And it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. So here this is, this is Paul. Uh, uh, this is after Paul's uh, explained to the church the unbelievable grace and love of the Father that elected them and brought them into a relationship with himself, even while they were his enemies. This speaks of us, too. And Paul says he calls them to offer 
their bodies. He calls us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, or another word, hallowed and acceptable God, which is theirs or our spiritual worship. He calls us individually and corporately. Remember, the prayer starts, the Lord's Prayer starts with our Father. And we are together. So we're individually, but corporately, we have to remember that we are called to present our bodies, all that we are, our personality, our energy, our intellect, our emotions, our gifts, our attitudes, our ambitions. Offer it not as a dead sacrifice, but he says a living sacrifice. One that's alive, one that's animated, that can reason and respond, that is ever-changing and maturing and developing and producing life. Present your bodies as one lifelong offering, not for your own fame, but for His fame, for the glory of of, of the Father's name, that we would hallow Him. Now, now, if you were to read on, if you and we, we're going to read parts of it, but I'm going to encourage you to read the rest of chapter 12 of Romans, um, what it means to live this hallowed life. See, Romans 12, Paul describes what this living sacrifice looks like, what a lifestyle that hallows the name of our Father before the world looks like in practical everyday living. Now, let's start with verse 3 of chapter 12 of Romans. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, what's this have to do with the Lord's Prayer? Hallowed be your name. In making that request, hallowed be your name, we are asking that the Father's name be treated as holy, and that his name, which represents all that he is, should be seen and understood as sacred or holy or set apart in our lives, in the lives of his people, and that his name should not be despised by the thoughts or the words or the conduct of those who have been created in his image. In Romans 12, Paul describes that kind of that living sacrifice, that lifestyle that would hallow the name of our Father before the world in, the, in, in what it looks like in, in practical everyday living. And so let's, let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. And we're going to look at actually the message translation here uh, there's adds a little bit to this that it, it helps us see, see some things. Um, it says, I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. We're called to live a life that is marked by humility and meekness, understanding all that we are, all that we have, all that will ever be is due to what God has done for us. Romans 12, 4 through 8 and this is the ESV uh, we'll read here, uh, reads, For as in one body we have many members. And remember again, remember the Lord's Prayer is an our Father, meaning together as, as a group, these members together. And Paul's talking about here, says, One body, we have many members, and members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We each have a responsibility to present our bodies and to function with our giftedness to enable the body, the the community that we're a part of, to function as a whole, the our, the people of God. Each of us is getting our meaning from the whole, not the other way around. We are to be engaged and responsive as individuals within this ever-changing, ever-growing, interacting, interactive community offering that we bring to the Father, that hallows the Father's name. 
And with that, you have to understand there's no there's there's no room for passivity here. Paul is calling for being intentional, being persistent, persevering and living out this lifestyle, this living sacrifice that hallows the Father's name through the life of individuals and through the life of the community as a whole, that we live such a way that our life hallows his name and within the world we live in. So remember, hallowed be your name is to be seen in the context of the hour, like our Father, our community, as being a part of his community to, to facilitate his purpose and his fame not our own. Remember, it's not about us. It's not about the church. It's not about individuals. It's not about us gaining any fame or a, a name for ourselves. But living in such a way that we live in humility and meekness and honoring our Father and knowing our relationship with Him and confidence of who we are and what He has done and who we are in Christ. And in turn, we live in such a way that it brings fame to His name. In Romans 12, 9, uh, there's another verse here I want to go to. Um, Let love be genuine, it says, Paul, Paul says here. And he says, abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. So he says, let love be genuine. Let it be real. Let it be without any hypocrisy and let it be demonstrated and not just talked about. Something people see, the world around us, that that love is genuine and real. And then he goes on to say, abhor what is evil. Make note, he doesn't say, he does not say, abhor who is evil, but what is evil? He says, abhor, he says, detest it, hate evil, whatever is grievous or whatever undermines healthy community. Abhor it. And then he goes on and says, but hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to what is honorable and what is beneficial to building healthy, functional community that hallows the name of our Father in heaven. Remember, the context is community. And remember Jesus' prayer we looked at last week that comes from John 17, 21, when he prays, he prays for the, the believers, so those that would become believers because of the words of the disciples. That's us. That we would all be one, just as the Father is in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father, and that we would also be, they would also be in us. And for the one purpose would be that the world may believe that the Father sent Jesus. See, here's this context. Here's some of the undergirding beliefs and values of Jesus. And even Paul, he's he's teaching here in Romans. This this prayer is not just to say some words and throw them out into the air. It's based on this intimate, dynamic, uh, living relationship, this sacred conversation we have with our life and our words and our works with our Father while we live within this world. And as we do that, we, uh, we hallow His name. And I encourage you to, to read through the rest of Romans 12 on your own and look at what a living sacrifice looks like and one that would really hallow the name of our Father, that the world would see who the Father is and that they would believe that He is the one who sent Jesus for the sake of our salvation. Jesus was constantly moving the activity of the kingdom out of the temple, outside the sacrificial system, outside the religious ceremony, and the need for a priest, outside of the synagogue and the church and the institution, into the sanctuary of everyday life, and to hallow the name of God before the world. That's what he did with the woman in Samaria, uh, of Samaria, that Samaritan woman at the well. He comes there. Jesus did just that with her. When he was at the well, and as a result, she and the whole community came to believe in Jesus. This, come, this is part of the, the undergirding beliefs and values that we see the whole of Jesus' life that really speaks to when he's, when he's giving them or us, those disciples that he's speaking to in us now, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's talking about living such a life, not because just in a sanctuary, not in, during a religious ceremony, not during a, sac, a sacrificial system and being a part of that institution, but in the everyday sanctuary of life. 
hallow the name of God before the world. Just as he did with the Samaritan. It wasn't in the institution, wasn't in the synagogue, not a part of the religious system. It was outside the need for a priest. It was between the Father and him, in spirit and truth. The physical temple and the religious system, the Old Testament, was a type and shadow of what was to come in Christ. And it pointed to us, the people of God being the temple of God. The Old Testament temple was the dwelling place of God, the place of his presence, the place where heaven and earth touched. It was the place of encounter with God. It was the place that hallowed his name. You see, that's the Old Testament. Then Jesus comes on and he starts to te- teach this, this prayer and he, he, gives, he gives a picture of this lifestyle before the Father. So now in Christ, we are the temple. We are the dwelling place of God. We mean believers, not just everybody in general. Those who have given their life to Christ. We're the dwelling place of God. We're the place of his presence. We're the place where heaven and earth touch wherever we are. We get to carry God wherever we go, individually and as a community. We are a people of encounter with God. We communicate with God wherever we are, and He communicates with us. And through us, wherever we are, we're to hallow His name by our life, that others can encounter the Father and know Him for who He is and be transformed and healed by Him. You see, the question comes down to is... Will it be a hallowed life or a hallowed life for you? Which would you rather live, hallowed or hollow? And Jesus is calling us to live in such a way in this sacred conversation that God is, is crying out, understanding God, let your name, let, your, let who you are be hallowed in our lifestyle. And all that we do, all we say, think, attitudes, motivations, all those things, that it hallow your name and make your fame be known in the earth, in the world we live in. Well, I pray that I blessed you this week. Um, as we come to a close, I just uh, want to let you know that you can uh, re-listen to this um, a program uh, by going to my website, uh, letyourkingdomcome.com. That's letyourkingdomcome.com. You can listen to it again there or share it with other people that they, they might want to listen to it. And um, you can also um, subscribe to the podcast that comes um, at, at, at the website as you listen to the, the program. Well, until next week, and pray uh, God's blessing and favor be on you this coming week.